Good afternoon to everyone. Um, this is Sam Drew with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with co-host and colleague Marty Duckenfield. We are broadcasting to you from a beautiful day in Clemson, South Carolina, from Clemson Radio Production Studios. It's about 80 degrees here, and I guess it's from Minnesota, and I think it's 50 degrees there in St. Paul. So a uh, beautiful day. Hope the weather is, is good um, where you are and where you're listening from. Um, I want to welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you uh, by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University, and we're in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and with the generous support of Catapult Learning and Penn Foster. And uh, I just want to say that we really appreciate those folks at Catapult Learning and and Penn Foster, and they really supported us for the long term. They have been with us from the beginning, and they have made this happen. Good afternoon, everyone, and boy, do we appreciate you coming inside to listen to us because... Since we know it's beautiful here, we were astounded to hear that it's also beautiful up in Minnesota. So everywhere in this country must be a beautiful spring day, and it's not even officially spring. This is so amazing. So thank you for joining us, and welcome to Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. Yeah, it's really good to be back with those of you who've participated before, but we especially want to welcome the new listeners to the program. We always have them, and so welcome And we have a great topic for you today. It's one of my favorites, as you know, Sam. It's service learning. And so we think we've got an exceptional program planned for today. So I'm ready to get started. So let's begin. Now, the first thing I need to do is to remind our listeners of the materials that are provided on the website for today's program. First of all, and most important for listening, is the slide presentation. Now, you'll see that up at the top there. It's, in fact, a PowerPoint but it's been turned into a PDF for today's discussion. So open that up and have it ready. There's some really excellent research articles I want to point out there that you can read after the program. Uh, Very important to see is the K-12 Service Learning Standards and Indicators for Quality Practice, which will be talked about a bit today, and it's in PDF format. But um, in addition to several of the other websites, is a website with a video production called The Lift, L-I-F-T, which is an amazing resource that demonstrates through film delivered on the Internet what service learning looks like and particularly highlighting these standards. So this, this is, I love that website, and we'll hear more about that. So, hey, Sam, we got a lot of good information here for our listeners to turn to at the end of the program. We, we sure do, Marty, and I was really impressed with that last resource. I think they'll be great for follow-up. And, you know, these... Um, these resources are, are, are always good because this program really is designed uh, for you to use, not only to listen to, and we, we really appreciate you listening in live and going to the archives, but really to use for uh, personal, small group, or whole faculty professional development. That's really how we design these programs, and I hope that you're able to make use of them in that way. Yeah, all the resources are there, so uh, we do hope you follow up with that. You know, uh, the wonderful thing about the webcast when they're live, is that you, the listeners, have the opportunity to engage in discussion with our presenters. And so those of you who are listening live today, you have that advantage. So we're inviting you to be an active part of the program today. And so we've got two ways that you can do this. First, because this is a radio call-in show, we encourage you to call in your questions for our guests. And our toll-free call-in number is... And it's on the website, but here it is, 888-539-8859. And if you're outside the U.S., and we did have someone uh, a few months ago who wrote to us from Prague. This was so cool. But if you're going to call us, the number is 864-656-4549. So you can begin calling now or any time during the program. We'll be putting you on hold for a few minutes, but we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as we can during the broadcast. Now, as an added benefit for today's program, if you are a caller, we will send you a free copy of your choice from the NDPC's Linking Learning with Life series of service learning publications. There's over 30 on so many topics, wonderful series of publications. These are listed on the resource page. We'll link you right to it. Now, when you do call, give Eric your name, your email address, and your phone number so we can follow up and make sure you get the uh, book of your choice. We want you to have the opportunity to interact with these guests and with us. 
And so as an additional benefit, as we did last year, your name, if you call in today, your name will go into a hat for a chance to win a free conference registration to the National Dropout Prevention Network conference that will be held um, next year, October 2012, in Orlando, Florida. Mm-hmm. And um, Marty, I've noticed that our um, our winner from last year has made it a habit of calling every program, so he's, <laughs> he has the system figured he, out. He's so, got it figured out. So give him out. some competition. <laughs> <laughs> Give them some competition. And it's a great prize. Oh, my goodness. You know, we're also accepting email questions, and this is absolutely fine. She would add so much to the program to know what your concerns are. We don't, we can't imagine all of them, and we want to hear from you. So write to us at ndpc at clemson.edu with the words solutions in the subject line. And, you know, I'm going to make a decision right now, Sam. If they write in, they can get a they can select from the Linking Learning with Life series too. Yeah, that's such Let, a great be, series. Let's and be it really generous today. Yeah, fits this program well. Yeah, so we'll get to those questions as well. We look forward to hearing from you, whether you call or you write in. Good. Okay, now we've gotten the administrivia done, so let's move on to our program today, and we're both excited about this. Our topic this month is increasing student academic engagement with district-wide service learning programs. And um, service learning is such an important um, strategy uh, that w- that we advocate among those 15 effective strategies advocated for over a decade now by the National Dropout Prevention Center. And connecting that to student engagement, um, which which is so important for kids staying in school and for academic achievement, uh, I just think is an exciting topic. Um, this um, this whole effort of increasing student academic engagement with district-wide service learning programming is an effort that's being led by the National Youth Leadership Council. Uh, and, in fact, they're looking for more districts across the United States to uh, provide support and join them uh, in this effort. So joining us today from, as I said earlier, a studio in St. Paul, Minnesota, is our longtime friend and colleague, Michael Van Coolen, who serves as Director of Outreach for the National Youth Leadership Council in St. Paul. Currently, he's also the National Director for uh, Project Ignition, uh, which is a grant program that provides resources to public high school youth and their teachers who take the lead in the issue of teen driver safety through service learning. Mike, it was good to see you at our recent conference, and we are really delighted to have you uh, join with us today. Oh, well, thanks so much. I'm I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I'm going to try and bring the Minnesota accent to some of this radio world, and so <laughs> proud to be here. Yeah, yeah we, we, we need, we need a we? counter yes. accent. <laughs> That's multicultural, okay. <laughs> well, service learning, Mike, is, is certainly uh, one of the most effective dropout prevention strategies that we have identified, and um, we're pleased to have you here today to talk not only about that and also tell us more about the National Youth Leadership Council, but in particular the the connection of all this with student um, engagement. So um, I I think in addition uh, to today's discussion um, examining how all this affects dropout prevention, um, we'll also be interested in 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 hearing how you've worked in in Guilford County. We've had mm-hmm. uh, we've had some experience also with um, Guilford County, um, which is a very a very large school district, really in North Carolina, um, and they're embracing this strategy and um, and what lessons um, you, Mike, and NYLC are learning uh, f- from that experience. Um, so I want to begin, uh, but I, I do want to just take a second and uh, and tell our listeners again that um, uh, if you want to call in, and we hope that you will, the toll-free number is 888-539-8859. So please pick up the phone, call. If a question comes to mind, uh, we we promise we'll make it easy for you, and um, and we'd like, we'd like to get you on the air uh, to interact with uh, Mike. So, Mike, I know you've done a lot of preparation for this, and um, yeah. I think we would um, want to just sort of go to your PowerPoint now and let you <laughs> begin, and we may interrupt you and as we have questions, and we hope that our listeners will do the same. Well, I just really want to encourage the, the conversation uh, with anybody out there. Uh, yes, we've got PowerPoint, but I've been... Uh, murdered by PowerPoints many times previously as well. So <laughs> let's be careful with that. And uh, um, 
uh, that said, I, I hope um, if people are interested in following along that they've been able to access that. And uh, so I thought I'd maybe go to what is now the second slide, which uh, basically is a little discussion about the National Youth Leadership Council and giving you a context of the organization and not spend a lot of time on that. But basically, um, the National Youth Leadership Council, or NYLC, it's often known as, it's been around for almost 30 years and uh, is one of those founding organizations uh, uh, in helping define and promote uh, service learning as a primary strategy out in, in the world in education, nationally, internationally. And that's still work we do um, uh, as a, a policy and advocacy, etc. Uh, we also spend a lot of time uh, working directly with youth in, in the country, and uh, this summer we host the National Service, uh, I'm sorry, the National uh, Youth Leadership Training, and that takes place where we bring in youth from all over the country for an intensive training um, into leadership, service learning concepts, etc. Primarily uh, addressing the achievement gap is a strategy that they're focused on right now, so that's a big piece. Um, I think I sometimes think of NYLC as a, a triangle of efforts in that we have policy advocacy. And then we have programs, and we also have uh, research. So those three pieces kind of make up, inform you know, um, each aspect of the organization. And I'm proud to work there. Uh, it's my fifth year with NYLC, oh so it's, it's been terrific for me. Yeah, it is um, a terrific organization. It's one that we have enjoyed a relationship with oh, for decades, many, now. many years. <laughs> we uh, can even say decades, and, uh, and oh, hope man. we'll continue that into the future. <laughs> and, and I think one of my excitements about uh, our, our continued work together is they both strike me as very vital organizations and very central and not simply tied into uh, old practices or networks. And so I I have great respect for the Dropout Prevention Center and obviously for NYLC. And so we, uh, we're always talking and looking for new ideas to uh, find things together. Yeah, it does take a great deal of invention, doesn't it, Mike? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Unfortunately, it never gets any easier, does it? So anyways, as, as I was mentioning, maybe on the next slide, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about service learning as a concept. I know it's been around a long time, and here in Minnesota, it was really born uh, in a lot of ways out of the community education uh, programs and so sometimes it gets confused with uh, similar uh, forms of of uh, student experiences, community service, volunteerism, uh, service oriented programs. And I really want to emphasize that service learning uh, for the National Youth Leadership Council is primarily um, a pedagogy. Mm-hmm. That um, certainly it has important uh, social justice and public issues, but our intention is, and the, and this is borne out through the research that. Uh, service learning is used when you have pre-existing learning um, goals, academic goals. It could be standards. It could be many different things. And then you're saying, well, now how could these have increased value? So service learning is one of those ways where you take whatever it is you wanted to learn and you use it for a public purpose. You're, you're really asking the question, well, what, what's the meaning of this? What's the value of learning this? And exploring that right now. So... Uh, I, it, you have a specific definition on the slide, but I just wanted to fill that out a little bit. So again, I think key points would be that that we would uh, tie it as a pedagogy, uh, a way of teaching, and tied to uh, pre-existing learning experiences. And um, I think a lot of times, uh, uh, very common for us right now is we tie it to the backwards design model mm-hmm. in, in when we think about how teachers can implement or how schools can implement service learning. So that's something we'll visit again later in this uh, mm-hmm. presentation. And, and so, I think um, I, I think that it, um, it bears mentioning uh, again or emphasizing this uh, pedagogy versus uh, service. It's interesting, uh, Mike, that you say that uh, this was in, in um, s- some respect anyway born out of community education because 30 years ago that was actually my field and that mm-hmm. was a time when community education was booming. And we had the same kind of argument, a little different in that we were arguing process over program. Mm-hmm. Um, that community ed was more than just a program in schools. It was a whole process for community involvement. And this, it, it seems um, like that argument, the, the pedagogy versus uh, service, that service learning is service, but it's much more than that. It's a, it's a pedagogy. Right. And and then I think that pendulum can swing too hard, too. You and, know, well, that's uh, true. Certain, Absolutely. You know, and so I think we try to walk the balance, but you always are speaking in the context of the times. And so I think any anybody who views service learning – right now has to understand that it's something that enters the academic environment and strengthens the academic environment. I think there is all kinds of 
literature and and backing to talk about the community engagement and the, and and the justice issues you know regarding achievement gap mm-hmm. or whatever it may be and those remain vital it's just we we i think right now our feeling is that the pedagogy piece has been underserved in in the conversation mm-hmm. and so we're trying to reassert that perhaps yeah, good point so um, on the next slide, uh, I think I've identified um, what are the uh, eight standards that make up the K-12 service learning standards for quality practice. That is a lousy title. Am I right? Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that on radio, but that's quite a long title. So whoever came up with that, I'm sorry for publicly uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it took there, two lines. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite a title. Um, and, but I, I understand the intention, I guess. But more importantly, the standards themselves have been very important, uh, at least um, – uh, when they came out in 2008 as published, um, I thought they were a real game changer because they really did help define this is what we're talking about. These are the elements that are research-based that we really have determined are vital to a high-quality service learning experience. And uh, I think anybody can see that that list there. Uh, I don't know that I would highlight any particular one, um, but uh, there are many tools out there right now. Um, NYC has got a site where you can... You can do some evaluation of your own programs and do some self-assessments and, and sort of determine um, how well are we doing on the concept of youth voice? How well are we addressing diversity and engaging the concepts of diversity? Or how well is reflection built not only at the end but as sort of a formative process throughout the learning experience? And I think uh, both of you would also support the idea that reflection is one of those vital learning times. It's the time when the deepest learning takes place and uh, has been a very important part of why we say uh, service learning is a pedagogy. Yep, I would certainly echo that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I just don't feel there's a rhyme or reason for this, the sequencing of standards in a way, mm-hmm. but, I mean, the meaningful service is so much the heart of it all, and then, I mean, it's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. it's got to be the core. You eliminate that, and so much is taken away. But right there, number two is linked to curriculum, and they right. make, you're sending that message that it's a pedagogy. Right. And the meaningful service, I think, is interesting in that, you know, the question becomes, well, meaningful to whom? And and I think the, the, the ideal answer is not only is it meaningful to the learner that, okay, if I was to go do this project, um, I care. It would matter. So that differentiates it from, say, okay, everybody, let's go pick up trash. And mm-hmm. I'll tell a quick story on that. I had a good friend, I'll, I'll give his first name, Carter, who uh, grew up in Kentucky. And uh, he decided that he was going to have his students, who were coming from a, uh, a, a poor section of, um, I believe it was Lexington. And uh, he thought, you know, he'd read somewhere that, you know, in, in tough neighborhoods, the cleaner the streets, the less, the less violence. So he thought he'd have all the students one day go out into the streets and, uh, you know, clean them up. And, wow, what a great idea. You know, he saw a big vision for, you know, uh, community safety and pride and, and all these things. And so he got everybody an orange vest and he got everybody a bag and, a, and, a, and one of those poker things. And... And one day he sent everybody out. We all went out in the streets. So there's Carter walking behind all of these students one day on a school day as they're picking up trash in the streets. And you know that a few mothers and a few fathers poked their head out the window and said, what is my son or daughter doing on a school day picking up trash? <laughs> so is, 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 that, is that the dream you have for my children? So, so the point being... The meaning yeah. is so meaning much more eyes. important than simply the service, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, he could have perceived that was a wonderful service to provide the world, but he could not defend the meaning. And uh, he, he didn't stay in Kentucky long. <laughs> <laughs> Real long. But, uh, you know, I think that sometimes we get idealistic and we want to go change the world and we can go too fast. And I think really checking in on the meaning to community, the meaning to the student, the meaning to the school, um, those are all important aspects of meaningful service. So, well, maybe we could jump to the next slide. And okay. not, but I, I would really welcome if anybody's got further questions regarding the standards and would like, you know, further conversation, happy to do that. Um, the next slide is the service learning cycle. And I think this is interesting, and it's something that NLC has been promoting for a few years. Uh, it, it's been in concept, but been in print just for a f- couple of years now. And, and I want you to imagine this is really targeted towards those that are creating service learning programs, maybe teachers, maybe district administrators, et cetera. And it's speaking to them at that point. So when you think about, well, okay, I get the standards, and I know youth voice is important. 
and all these things. But how do I do it? How do I build this? And so this cycle really helps people understand how to go about that work. And you can see on the right-hand side, identifying academic goals, that's where it begins. We ask people to first identify what are the things that, well, if you're a teacher, you were hired uh, at some point during the year to please teach this information. Um, that preexisted your idea to do service learning or anything. So what are those things? And can you understand them in deep and complex and rich ways? And I say that because the ideal is that you could then imagine that there's many ways to learn that information. If you say, well, I'm, I'm here to cover Chapter 17, which uh, uh, prepares them for that quiz, well, that'll be a struggle to turn that into service learning. But if you said, I wanted young people to understand the concepts of, of democracy as it's applied in community settings or whatever that may be, the more richly you understand that, the more you can understand when you talk to students and they say, okay, well, there's this issue that I really care about. And I'd like to address that. How could I match that up to that academic outcome? So then you start to beginning to identify genuine needs. Sometimes teachers like to do that and get a head start, and sometimes the teachers like to have students go do that, uh, what we sometimes call a walkabout or an investigation in a community. And then you begin to negotiate that. So as you can see, as we're moving through the cycle, we're still in what is called the pre-service stage, which is just mapping things out. What are, what are our goals? What are our interests? What are we going to try and do here? And then very important is, before we figure out the exact projects, if we said this is what we wanted to learn, this is what I really want every young student in my classroom to understand, well, how would I know? What evidence would I see? And again, the more complex that you understand, the more room you're giving students to meet you part way. So um, this is, when I mentioned the backwards design, this is very similar to the uh, Wiggins and McTee uh, backwards design uh, piece. And so, you know, what are the goals? Uh, what are the measurements? And then you start developing the plan and the resources necessary. So um, I won't go through the cycle any further other than to say you'll see that most of the process is in the planning and the organizing, not just for the teacher, but the student and teacher in negotiation together. That's what I always found interesting over the years. I mean, the service is the part that everybody focuses on, but what mm -hmm. took the most time was not the service itself, but all the uh, research and the planning um, and so many things that had to be done and learned before you could even do that service. And this, this chart really shows it so well. It's nice to see the visual. Well, yeah, I think so too. And and I remember well as a teacher when I was learning to become more of a project base and, and eventually a service learning teacher, I had to learn that it, the preparation was the important ingredient that was that did allow me to turn the classroom over so that I, you know, we always talk about be the facilitator, the support, the manager, all these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Those are all based in the amount of preparation created ahead of time. Right. And so... So uh, that's a, a space that we really want to, when we talk about how we work with teachers, I just want to emphasize that that's our emphasis. On the next slide, you meant, uh, and, and I just... I might oh, say, go ahead. Um, Mike, I'll say, yeah, I, I mean, and, and you can certainly appreciate the um, the difficulty of, of this as an approach if, if, if one has not taught in this way before. Mm -hmm. So I would, ex I would expect that quite a bit in the way of professional development would be required. And I think you talk about that, or you're going to talk about that a little later. Yeah, but, yeah and, and, but, and, and I think I would, I've got a question here that I've been trying to fit in in the right place, yeah. and maybe this conversation we're having right now is the place. Uh, Kelly, from I think it must be Smyrna, well, Smyrna West Alternative School has written. I'm guessing Georgia, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she's enjoying the webinar. And uh, service learning is a major component of their alternative school program, and they serve students in grades 6 through 12, sent here for behavior or zero tolerance violations. And service learning is a very important part of helping these students to see themselves as part of the solution instead as part of the problem. So, But nevertheless, there are teachers who still consider all service learning experiences as fluff. So mm -hmm. high stakes testing and new teacher evaluation models do not allow for fun activities, fun is in quotes here, or originated by student voice. So it's a hard battle to fight. Have you got suggestions to help them move things forward in that school? That is a brilliant question. <laughs> Isn't and, it? And, yeah. and, and it hits right in my heart, too, because, uh, Kelly, thank you for that. I, I was an alternative uh, school teacher for 12 years and a principal of an alternative school for another oh, 100. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, four, actually. But uh, <laughs> I, I, it, it, 
I think that's right on. And one of the things I would I would suggest is stop moving. Uh, maybe alter the language away from. There's no room for fun, but change that word to meaning. Um, when you say, "Well, can be can educational be meaningful?" Mm-hmm. as opposed to fun. I think it's easy to argue, you know, for some people to say, well, it doesn't have to be fun. It's supposed to be hard work. But if they have to argue education is not supposed to be meaningful, <laughs> that's a harder stance to take. And when you position yourself there that whatever we do, we must find a way not just to have ourselves cover the material and have the students get the answers on the quiz, but they have to find their education to be meaningful. And we have some ways that we know for decades now, that we can do that. It's possible. Now, um, those are choices you make. And so I, w- I would tend to position around the word meaningful mm-hmm. as advancing that conversation. See what great answers you get from our experts <clears throat> when we have them on the air. We encourage you to call and talk to Mike at 888-539-8859. We've been having a pledge drive in South Carolina here. Right? <laughs> I almost feel like asking for donations, which we'll take. But um, basically, we're wanting your questions and your comments uh, to share with Mike Van Coolen and Sam and me. So. Um, let's move forward, and, and sure. we'll see if we have calls later. But we've got a good slide coming up. I like that one. You know yeah. I do. And, and, and I think it goes right to Kelly's question as well, or comments. Uh, so this, this quote, that service learning is not one more thing on the plate. It is the plate. So in another, I think it's another way of saying that um, the meaning of the education, the value of the education, is not something that you have to add to what you do. It's how you do it. It's the it's the purpose and the direction, and so it, it's an orientation that um, uh, uh, Dr. Beth Folger, who is in Guilford County Schools in uh, North Carolina, and and again we will talk more because just brilliant work happening in the in that district, but um, that's been their mantra that um, uh, we have seen more initiatives, in, in, even in my short history of education of of twenty twenty something years, uh, I've seen more initiatives come and go. Um, this is an orientation that has been here all the time, and uh, I, I, I'm really drawn to it. So I appreciate that you like that slide too, Marty. Oh, you know I do. I, it's, <laughs> it's probably my favorite in the whole batch. <laughs> well, uh, so you can. Well, I hope people will stick around anyway. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, if we go to the next uh, uh, somehow, somehow diminished slide, <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, I'm an odd person, folks. So just hang in there. So the <laughs> crisis in school engagement, and, and that's really the point that I, I think uh, the focus for a lot of this uh, is that um, service learning has been engaged and tried to address so many issues and taken on so many battles. Right now, for the at least the National Youth Leadership Council, we are asserting that we want to stand the ground because research has has borne it out that service learning does a fantastic job of student engagement. Of, of, of increasing student engagement. So part of what I wanted to do is just to make a note of this is a major issue. Um, when we think about dropout prevention, when we think about students staying in school but getting by, hanging in there, that glazed overlook, those are just as great a crisis. Oh, well, yeah. And so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the crisis, uh, as, as, and I'm careful to use that word, I promise you, crisis. But So about half of our students feel involved in and enthusiastic about school. So that f- for, for that, I feel warranted to use that word crisis. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. And I won't run through all of this, but I just think um, when we see that half the students are bored, and as a teacher, I was struggling with this issue just as much as anyone else out there, and it can be a very deflating experience as a teacher, as an administrator, to see this and struggle with it day after day, um, that you you begin to cling to those that are inspired, excited, um, and, and sort of use that as to define how well your class went that day. And so I know the feeling, and I've also d- witnessed uh, amazing teachers uh, able to get past that uh, uh, with so many students. And so that's that's what this work is about. So, oh, and I also want to mention that uh, it's also borne out that it's been exceptionally, uh, exceptional, service learning has been exceptional in addressing what we would call the most at-risk or, or uh, um, m- most disengaged students in a school district. So the greater at risk, the more marginalized the population, it seems that service learning is more adept at addressing that issue. So going back to Kelly and the at-risk population, 
a, a brilliant strategy for that population. I want to use this slide too, Mike, to um, emphasize again um, the terms that you used in the answer that you gave Kelly, because mm-hmm. um, that that uh, that actually had an impact with me too, because I'm afraid I'm guilty of having used that term "fun" also mm-hmm. from time to time, and um, I don't think I was talking about fun and in terms of thrills, but, mm-hmm. but really it is um, uh, meaning, uh, you know, those things that are meaningful to us or fun. And when you look at half of high school students bored in school every day, uh, again, in there in that instance, it's not, it, it's not because they're not having fun, um, but rather they're not finding meaning. Right. And, and I think fun can mask. Um, yeah. that, that seeking of meaning. Um, I was a, I think as you've seen on the call here or on the radio show so far, but as a teacher, I was a silly man. I could entertain a crowd. I could spin and dance and tell stories and things. Yeah. But that would mask the effort sometimes of, wait, why are we here? And and when students were reacting to, this is boring, I needed to respond to that more than dance and sing and make them happy to be there anyway. Yeah. And so I think that's part of the challenge. So, well, thanks for that, Sam. So um, going on to the next slide again, um, I think um, uh, issues in focus. Am I right? Is that where we are? That's That's where where we are. are. Very good. Great. And declining engagement, um, again, is is the the heart of this. And I really want to emphasize that as we're talking about this and talking about teacher-specific situations, I really want to assert that this is systemic um, and any systemic problem requires systemic solutions, and so that's part of why we're talking about a system response, um, district-wide response, that if we just ask teachers to be more effective, more efficient, better practitioners, I sometimes think about it, uh, when I was a teacher, I'd often go through workshops and trainings, and they were very technique-oriented. Um, if you just did this, if you just spoke this way, if you just stood this way, um, it would increase the quality and and so I was forever being trained into better and better techniques, um, and and that somehow would improve the situation. It, so I felt like I was being trained how to ride a bicycle better. And so often I'd sit back and think, well, that's great. I, it's good to ride the bicycle well, but I want to know where the bike is going. <laughs> and uh, uh, so sometimes it's good to step back and not get too wrapped up into... Um, if teachers would just do this sort of teacher-proofing technology and teacher-proofing perspective of, of how we can improve the classroom and recognize that there's, there's, there's systemic issues as well. And so um, so I, I think we've seen or I've seen too few systemic solutions, and very often district initiatives become disjointed, temporary. Um, uh, I've seen... Uh, I've been a part of many a project where the district is filled with happy talk. Boy, this is great. Boy, we all, we all love doing this. And uh, as soon as the next superintendent's gone, we'll uh, we'll be happy about the next initiative. Mm-hmm. And so um, we want to be very careful of that in this uh, when we talk about systemic uh, practices. So um, moving on to the next slide, uh, and that is why are students disengaged? Um, and uh, that's a complex question, isn't it? You know, um, and I know there are all kinds of answers to that. And, and anybody who has been a teacher or administrator, worked in schools, or even been to schools, they've got many uh, uh, answers to that. But again, what we're asserting here is when a, when a student here, here's one where I was guilty of. Uh, a student would say in my classroom, um, uh, "Mr. Van Coolen, uh, do I need to know this?" And I'd say, "Well, yes, it's on the test." <laughs> You know, it was the most killing kind of a sentence that I could Mm -hmm. produce at that time. Mm -hmm. The reason you need to know this is because it's on a test, which is a purely academic reason, which is all based in this uh, system that you didn't buy into in the first place and just hang in there and now we'll entertain you. So uh, I really am thinking that we have a lot of work to do around um, moving all of this to meaning. And it's not just for the students. It's for the teachers, too, I believe that uh, I think teachers, as we talk about the test culture and, and, and the standards and things like that, that doesn't have to undercut is what I do meaningful, powerful, challenging. And in part, I know that because the students feel the meaning, the power, and the challenge. And so um, I, I, I really want to have us focus when we think about engagement around that issue. Mm-hmm. Um, 
let's see, only about 25 of high school students believe that school is providing them with the skills for adult life. And I, I think that's an important sense, but I'd also challenge it to say, I'd like to see how many times students feel that what they're learning is a value to their life right now. Very often we, we try to challenge students, well, work hard so you can get to college, so you can mm-hmm. in this very, very future-oriented um, conversation about education. And um, my experience with at-risk students, when especially if they were first generation uh, to ever achieve a high school diploma, that idea of selling them that they'll go to college someday uh, way down the line was a hard sell. They had lots of evidence where that wasn't going to happen or that wasn't a value. Or if that was a central value, it was somehow diminishing my my um, my family or the people I care about and know. And so uh, I really want to emphasize the value in saying, where's the meaning, where's the gift I'm given, the ability and talent I'm given to the world now, and not being so future-oriented. So... Um, the next slide, again, a few more comments about um, uh, uh, why, why the disengagement. And um, I really start to uh, have been thinking more about this belonging issue. Um, and that's a vital component to, uh, that we know that service learning addresses, and it has a major impact on dropout and at-risk um, uh, experiences for students. So um, uh, we know that service learning has been exceptional at producing an increased uh, sense of belonging uh, for students into school communities and societies. And I think that's important. Um, I, I worked in a, in a sort of a, a suburban alternative school for a period of time as well as urban. And in both instances, uh, it was my impression that students tended to not leave the community. Um, after they would graduate, or even if they didn't graduate from high school, they often ended up staying in that local area. Maybe it was a lack of opportunities for some. Uh, I don't know exactly. But uh, the, the point is that very often students had very negative or um, antagonistic relationship to so many aspects of their community. Um, and I thought that was something really important to address. It was a good thing that they belonged to the alternative school. And you, uh, you'd often hear, I love learning here. I feel like I belong. People care about me. We need to transfer that into the community context as well. It's because it's one thing to feel like I belong over there for those people who think differently about me, but everywhere else I'm in, in battle. Yeah. And so I think service learning is important to increase that positive relationship beyond me, the teacher, beyond the school, but me, but that student to society and, and community. You know, Mike, when we visited some, actually in Guilford County, um, Mm -hmm. some of the middle college high schools up there, um, small programs where you definitely saw this strong sense of belonging. And these schools have no more than 100 students. So the students are coming from larger high schools where they did not have that sense of belonging. So the question is, is how could we create this kind of community in a larger school? And I think where we kind of can be going with this is, as we get on the conversation, that sense mm-hmm. of belonging can be created, not just in the small schools where they can do, pull it off because they're small and they can be a community, but in large schools of two, 3,000 students. Right, right. Yeah, and so that's that's exciting just to um, p- contemplate how to do that. Yeah, I like that, and, and, and sometimes I can get a little lost in my own uh, narrative uh, story, but uh, that uh, I think Guilford County is an excellent example of how uh, very large schools, uh, large districts can orientate themselves to there's value what happens in this room beyond the room. And the community has a stake and an interest and a, and unbelievable number of resources willing to add to what's happening. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about is not having this all land on the head of a teacher. Um, very often service learning or uh, district-wide initiatives have asked teachers to be the center mm-hmm. and creator of yeah. And so I think when we talk about larger schools, um, how how do the resources of the district connect? I'll give you a quick example. Um, when we were in uh, Guilford County Schools last summer, one of the things we did was we, we did something like an RFP with nonprofits in the community, many nonprofits looking to provide services and resources to community, but in particular looking for access to youth. And that's always been a struggle. Uh, many, many nonprofits trying to have access to youth, but they say, well, well, we try to reach the, t- the, t- the teachers in the schools, but they just didn't want to work with us. And, and I think that happens sometimes. 
So what we did was we we did an RFP to school uh, to the nonprofits in the area and said we want you to come and learn what the academic goals are. We want to teach you what our job is, and if you understand what it is we're trying to accomplish, and you can come up with ideas to support what our academic goals are, now we can start to build a bridge and a relationship and use service learning as that bridge. So it it it's getting the community on board with what the job of the school is and not adding new jobs to the school. So again, it's that uh, it's not another thing added to the plate. It is the plate, mm-hmm. and that goes true. That's true for the school, but it's true for everybody who has a stake in seeing that student become an excellent learner. So, um, moving on again, just uh, I think I'll cut through some of these slides a little bit quicker. I don't want to. Um, that's uh, slide eleven. The U.S. student score, the international average. Uh, again, this is more about the belonging issue, and uh, my main point is that. Uh, that's a fundamental and necessary piece for a student's uh, continued and sustained engagement in school, but also I would extend that to the community components. And then the next slide... Well, we're going to yeah. stop here okay. for a minute because Carl okay. has been waiting patiently. Oh, uh, thank you, Carl. In Alaska, and I'd like to introduce Carl, who is, is an, a listener, a loyal listener, to Mike. And welcome, Carl, once again to the program, and I understand you have a question or comment for Mike Van Cooler. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marty. Uh, first off, this is probably one of the best um, uh, telecasts that I've heard throughout the um, National Dropout Prevention. The, this is just excellent and really hitting the needs for us here. Um, and I think one of the callers um, that was on uh, talking about the meaning and how important it is to, to get that meaning. Um, and one of the things that we're struggling here, um, again, we have a very small um, in population, but very large in geographic area. Um, just the um, definition of success. Um, the difference is the community and the students' definition of success is different than what most places would determine as success. Um, case in point, um, how does one um, uh, measure success of my my son is a good hunter of seals or polar bear, um, and we don't need your school um, mm-hmm. to continue our lifestyle, our traditional lifestyle. So, but uh, you know, and I'm, I think the information regarding why students are disengaged is just so powerful. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, no question, but just this is awesome. Keep keep it up. Oh, we love calls like that. We we like conversation, but we love those calls. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah, Carl, thank you so much. And and I think you really uh, bring up a great point that I'd like to expand on a little bit, if I could, this this issue of success. And I was thinking about the word achievement. And, uh, you know, and I think those are often, uh, uh, you know, shared in the same space. And when we think about it, you know, as far as the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish, what teachers are trying to accomplish, what communities are trying to accomplish, and if you say we want youth achievement for all of our children, well, that's an odd sentence. When we think about we want youth learning for all of our students and all of our youth, well, that, that starts to feel better. The one that I'm chasing and the one that I feel is most most true for me right now is development, mm. youth development. Mm-hmm. And if we think that's what the purpose of schools are about, it, re- it revitalizes that relationship to community. So when you think about that community where that, um, where that young man is, is doing the hunting and they, we say, yes, but we need, to train him, we need to train him so he will achieve, well, that's a really insulting, condescending, maybe even oppressive kind of orientation in my, my way of thinking. And when you say learning... Now now we've isolated that all the learning is going to happen in that box, in that room, in front of that person who will give, you know, and it's still, I'm still, I'm more comfortable, but I'm just not quite there. But when I think about development, that's an open door. That's a space where we will all come, and I understand why, as a teacher, I need community, and I'm not allowed to own and control the development of all the youth in the room, and yet I feel tremendous responsibility and I find myself in partnership, and that's, I'll say it again, it's an open door word. And so I would really, um, 
uh, encourage you to kind of wrestle with some of that language again. And um, I, I'd be curious. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully, there's a way to communicate, continuing, um, if if uh, that orientation gives you some advantages. We can certainly make that connection. And I invite other listeners to call in um, with comments or questions for Mike. You can see they're really worthwhile answers coming. 888-539-8859 or the email address ndpc at clemson.edu. But let's move forward, Mike. Cause, um, sure. Yeah, we're, we're going to, yeah. yeah, we're running out of time. So, uh, the engaging community slide, uh, slide 13, that, that's one I think we've just discussed, in fact. And, uh, um, it's finding everybody in the right relationship and recognizing that all of community has a responsibility to the development of the youth. And, uh, every person has a role in that system. And so I think that's an important piece. And when I think about it, in particular urban environments, I think it's just so vital to be able to reach out and build relationships that are not system to person. So, so often schools will say, well, you know, we don't get that parent to show up. But when the parent shows up, they feel like they're taking on an entire system, you know, the principal, the teacher, and all of that structure. And it's a very intimidating experience. I was the uh, principal for a school that served mostly immigrant refugee populations of students. And so one of the systems that we built in our service learning programs were com- um, uh, institution to institution. We helped build within the Somali community institutions that could then approach and represent parents and families that would talk to the school about issues. And it was a much less intimidating and um, uh, more just orientation to that relationship. Uh, Moving on to uh, student attributes. My second favorite slide. All right. (laughs) And and, Yeah, this one... uh, yeah, this this, right. this lands right in there. We Go have ahead. to promote our book here, Bouncing yeah. Back, and I'm going to make a special <laughs> a special pitch right now. If you call in during the next two minutes, not only will you get Bouncing Back, but you'll get it signed by the authors because we're sitting right here. So just throwing that in, <laughs> seeing how popular our book is. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> no. I, uh, I, I, am I going to get one of those? I, well, I think, you've, I think you're right. earning it. I think it. you qualify I, I, as calling I, I, in. I, I, yeah, you definitely are calling in. Begging on you, the air always gets it, it done. Yep, you got it, <laughs> so, Mike. So, okay. well, thank you so much, and uh, I already got it, but I'd like to sign <laughs> one. So anyway, I, uh, I just wanted to highlight that these are some fundamental uh, components to a quality learning experience, and we think service learning is adept and strengthens these capacities. Um, uh, aut- autonomy. I think what I, I want to make sure that's clear there is that intrinsically motivated, that um, uh, autonomy doesn't mean leave me alone, um, I'm going to go do what I want to do, but it really is the sense that I'm choosing the direction of my learning. Uh, I'm a participant, and I see the choice. And it's not a false choice like uh, I often, I'm going to say it on the air, like I do with my children, my own daughter, of, well, you can go to bed or you can, (laughs) sort of things. These false choices. Right. Uh, I mean very sincerely that students recognize I I have some space to own my own education. I'm not just simply a consumer of what's being presented to me. I'm an actor. I'm a participant. And then with competence, I think we're primarily talking about uh, uh, that you can function effectively in whatever the issue is, whatever the assignment is, whatever capacity. We want competence. And, and the more meaningful, again, to hammer that word home, the, the experience, the competence has everything to do with the sense of I'm talented. I, I'll be okay. I think very often students end up later in their high school career and, and they feel stupid. They feel, they feel disconnected and because very often, um, systems will say, well, what's wrong with you is, and so once you're fixed, you can come back into the system in a right way. And, um, I think it, it's not intentional. I think it's a function of a system that isn't quite as connected to competence, um, that it tends to move on. It's, it's less interested in that, in that, that achievement than it is sometimes in coverage. And so uh, in our standards world, I think that's a challenge that we always want to um, uh, make reference to. Mm-hmm. Um, civic development is a huge one and maybe too large for the time that we have to cover here today. today. So I'm going to kind of keep going. And, and um, again, uh, the next slide, how are these attributes addressed? Uh, surprise, surprise, we think service learning. And service learning, um, I think, is excellent at addressing uh, a couple key points. Um, something I mentioned was, why do I need to know this? You know, what's what's the point of learning this? Um, when you bring in 
value, not only to the student, but they feel like they're a part of something transcendent, something bigger than themselves. If I learn this, I could really be a provider in the world. And that's something that you're chasing as a, as a, as, a, as an educator, in, especially when you're in that orientation of development. And um, uh, I think it also addresses that that issue of, you know, when you're in a classroom and the students are sitting back and their arms are folded and they say, well, I'll let you know if I want to learn this or not. Mm-hmm. I'll decide if you're entertaining, if I like you. Oh, I went through that so many years, years and years and years. And uh, I think it was recognizing that this was a consumerist kind of attitude, deciding I have the right to decide if this is worth my time or not, as opposed to um, a, a function of, I'm a partner in this work, and I have to own this. And you know what? The state is paying thousands of dollars. The federal government is paying thousands of dollars for me to do this job. I don't get to sit back as a consumer. And so I could go on for a long time about that. But I think that's an interesting orientation to be thinking about in all of this work. And the more we can turn the value and the meaning and the ownership over to the students, the better off we are. Um, Next slide. Uh, uh, again, I think th- the heart of this primarily is that service learning has been demonstrated to be very adept at um, uh, students who are seen as at risk, uh, 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 low income, um, uh, uh, any of those orientations that, that I guess you could you could uh, um, use as labels for why students end up as at risk. Um, service learning has been shown to be incredibly effective at reengagement. And engagement is one of those that we're asserting is fundamental to a quality learning experience and academic achievement. So I want to talk very briefly now about what NYLC is trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do. Um, the next slide that talks about assumptions. Um, and uh, so the learning environment is a major influence of student engagement. That's assumed. We just believe that this is where the authority of this work is, in the classroom. And so we want to be working with teachers. We want to be working with the districts. We want to be working with administrators. This is where the work is. We don't need to change the entire economic structure of the United States to educate people well. Um, uh, I think very often uh, I use the orientation that... Um, uh, I wasn't paid to teach to the student I expected to walk in the door, the one I wanted to walk in the door, the one I thought would be most effective if he walked in the door. I was paid to teach to the student who did walk in the door. And we have that power and we have that authority. And uh, I'm very, uh, I'm a strong believer in the capacity of teachers to make a big difference. Yeah, I'm going to just, we're we're getting bombarded all of a sudden. And so, you know, we're going to have a lot, and we're going to go through the end. We've got time. What, one of the best things about our radio webcast is when that 4:30 hits and we're still going, we're still going because we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna share this with the people who call in and go through the entire sure. program. But we we are are getting a caller from Jim in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, Jim, I uh, would love to hear your comment or question for Mike. Uh, you are are on the air, I think. Uh, yes, here I am. There you are. Hi, Jim. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Hi, good to see you guys. This is fantastic. I appreciate the opportunity so much. Um, how do you convince teachers that mutual respect and relationship development is essential to their getting students motivated? Mm-hmm. Well, Jim, that's a good question and, 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 and a forever challenging. Um, for me, I think part of it is that it's possible coming to believe that it's possible to be other than what you've been doing or experiencing year after year. Um, I think teachers are so very challenged by the number of expectations, obligations, and um, uh, uh, I tell you, in my career, uh, I've never done anything as difficult as being a teacher, and I mean that very sincerely and not some patronizing uh, way. Uh, But when you get a flavor of what it's like to, to have a different orientation that is possible. In the same way, you know, that uh, when, when teachers are very prone to being controlling the classroom and doing all the talking and do all the, all the presenting, when they discover that, because they already knew there was a better way to do it, but when they discovered it themselves and found and experienced it, that was the game changer. And, and, I, and I think it is a belief that it's possible. I don't, I don't know how to say it another way. And I, and I think sometimes that's done by coaching. Sometimes it's done by small steps. But there's a, there's a sense of, 
Oh, well, I'll put, maybe I can put it like this. Um, when we want to change other people's behaviors or when we hope other people's behaviors might change, we so often will try to give them the information and, okay, now that you know, therefore you'll change. And I'll ask you this. Uh, uh, you know that it's illegal to go above the speed limit when you drive. You know that. There's no question of that. I'm asking anybody out in the audience, do you? But my response would be, but you knew you weren't supposed to. Why don't you? It's translating that into a belief system that you say, this is important and this is value and I can do something about it. That step is what will then eventually cause the change. Now, what is the magic bullet that moves from knowledge to belief? Well, there are a million of them and they're all true and they're all false depending on the context and the individual. But I, I do think it's important for anybody who wishes to see change know that they have to go past just simply setting up the knowledge base. And they have to move in towards the beliefs of the individual. Okay, Jim, uh, thank you for calling. And I hope that uh, met your needs. Do you have any more comments to make before we move on? I guess we're good. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. And speaking of beliefs, we're going to go to that slide, I guess. Isn't that where we sure. have core beliefs? Yeah. So the core beliefs of our, our initiative here, um, uh, I think that... Uh, we have come to absolutely believe that the central office is very important in district change now. Um, it was not so long ago that uh, it was common for new initiatives to arrive out of the central office, and the central office would send these dictates on down the line. And uh, you heard me say that before, the happy talk would begin. Oh, yes, we're all implementing the new initiative. The initiative is underway. Here it goes. On we go with the initiative. And the initiative had nothing to do with the initiative previously, with the previous superintendent or the previous leadership. or the. And then you get trapped into a cycle that says, okay, well, last year we didn't have a good idea, but everybody trust me, this year we've got it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a relationship within the district and a relationship without the district, outside of the district as well. And we talk to community members and say, okay, well, well, we got a whole new vision. Now we really got this. And it's really trapped in that expertness. And um, one of the shifts that are taking place is this focus on the learning in the classroom. There is more pressure than ever before that everybody in the district focus their energy and their attention on whatever we do must increase the quality of the learning experience. And we want that measurable and we want evidence but don't pour your energy and your time into it without it. So it's it's the belief that the central office has reorientated itself and is organizing in a better way across this country uh, initiatives and alignment um, and connection to other initiatives is vital. So that's a lot of what we're talking about here with NY, in NYC's effort is we see ourselves as a third party, and third parties are necessary in, in many systems for creating change because they can do that sort of external evaluation and they can put pressure on. But um, third-party initiatives or third-party support that is a summer workshop or a training that one often we're out of there and, and we've given you all you need to know, see you later, because we've run out of money. Those just are of no value and of no interest to NYLC at this time. Uh, we are looking for sustained relationship, right partners, uh, initiatives and districts that we say, yeah, where they're going we have something that we can add, and this looks like a fit, and we're going to chase that with that district. And that's a lot of what we're talking about in Greensboro, um, uh, Guilford County Schools in North Carolina. And I want to talk a little bit about them, if I can. Oh, yes. That um, in, uh, uh, boy, maybe three, it could be as many as four years ago, relationship began between uh, Guilford County Schools and the National Youth Leadership Council. Um, and they were seeking several important initiatives, one of them being character education, uh, dropout prevention efforts. And they were uh, doing all kinds of things. And um, I'll give credit to Brenda Elliott, uh, uh, who was uh, a new in the central office in the district. And she had gone to the National Service Learning Conference, which was in Nashville, I believe, that year. And she decided that this was going to be the vehicle, that she understood that it was difficult sometimes to get that um, initiative engaged and translated into student experiences, and she saw service learning as a vital tool. So what Guilford County did was they identified what were the fundamental and important initiatives in the district, and they added service learning to those. They didn't add another initiative. They took the ones that they thought were vital, 
and they use service learning as the implementation, the process. And so um, we began engaging teachers uh, through the summers, writing curriculum. And um, uh, 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 can I go on to the slide of the, the GSN slide, if that's sure. okay? Yeah. That's slide 22. Mm. And um, that that's an important piece, and that's a website that's available for those that are connected to service learning and interested in service learning. There are a few thousand teachers there right now, and it's a free site where people can just share ideas, practices, ask questions, form groups. So in a sense, it's a professional development site so that we can stay in relationships. So right now, um, you could go there and you'd see several pieces of work from Guilford County teachers, conversations going on. And uh, so when we go to uh, North Carolina, all the way from Minnesota, and you can only afford so many flights, how do you sustain that relationship? Well, these are one of the tools. This is one of the tools. I, I took a call just last week from a teacher uh, who uh, had received a grant, and she was so excited because she thought she could translate this to service learning, wanted help. That's your dream, that when you go and you do professional development and training and workshops and build these relationships, that they sustain for years. And and what turns what you get back is not, oh, I understand what you're talking about. It's here's the actual experience of my life as a teacher and the project I'm working on. Let's work together on this. And and that makes the, wor- the work worth doing. So um, I really want to emphasize that sustainability in this district initiative is very important. So I think I want to emphasize we're looking for right fit, and we are actively looking right now. Sam, you'd mentioned that in the beginning of the call. Mm -hmm. We're looking right now for districts that we might find close alignment and um, start to explore where are you going, how can we help, and is service learning going to be a piece that's fundamental to improving the quality, and in particular if that district is seeking to address student engagement. I think that's the piece that we really want to spend some time on. Let me just check in. How are we doing? I've well, we got have, a couple. We're doing well. Yeah. What, do you mm-hmm. want to take? Uh, this is interesting because yeah. it sort of expands uh, beyond district wide. Uh, this uh, particular uh, email writer, uh, mm-hmm. Robin. Hey, Robin. Um, and she says it's slightly off topic, but really, I don't think it is. But how do you feel this information translates to higher education? She's in AmeriCorps. Vista stationed at a community college to promote service learning initiatives on campus. And um, she thinks there's some good information here. She'd like to present it to some of our faculty. Would you see if you think it's appropriate? I mean, just, just talk about how there's the overlap here that's going on and uh, that she should see, that maybe you could point some right. things out. Yeah, I, I think there's very close alignment. And I think... Um, uh, higher ed has some advantages in this world and has some disadvantages as it relates to service learning um, uh, in that um, already you have a different orientation as to the student role in many of the courses, but not always. Very often it's been prone to the lecture and cover the textbook and and then move on, and it's not really a competency-based, and the meaning of all that learning is it dismissed as much as it is in any other learning environment uh, all too often. And so um, I think that higher ed uh, could look at those standards and give them as much weight and value as you would in uh, uh, pre-K-12 systems. Um, Yeah, and uh, I think community colleges particularly, um, they are just one step away from uh, high school students, and, and mm-hmm. the, and, and many of them are searching and, and needing some supports, and I think there's some really effective things. In fact, in Guilford County, back to that, is the, the yeah. middle college high school concept where there are students who are on a community college campus who I know would be benefiting as well from your work there in service learning in Guilford County. Right. And, and you know, uh, one orientation I think is really interesting in the higher ed right now is in the teacher education field that um, urban settings often – are inundated with teachers who don't have a lot of experience in urban settings. And so some of the teacher colleges are spending time using service learning as a part of the teacher prep in that uh, uh, student teachers go into an urban school to learn, not to go and save, not to go and fix, not to go and bring all that they are, um, that orientation, but to understand a different view um, and uh, maybe address some of these issues of diversity and multi- multicultural nature to uh, our world today, and so um, and honoring that. And so I think service learning um, has been very prominent in the teacher, but also in nursing. 
I've seen a lot of a movement in the nursing field that nurses are putting uh, service learning as a very important part of their t- of their training. Okay. And so I, I welcome that. Yeah, so there you go, Robin. There's there's something for you to start off with. I think all these materials are totally useful for you that we have on the website. I think we were thinking we were on the district-wide initiative process. Is this what right. we're up to? Okay. Yeah, yeah I think so. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, uh, but just briefly, the, the GSN side, but I also want to go back and mention the lift, which is the link. Oh, um, yes, yes, I guess. And, and, mm-hmm. and I'm, I, I'm very proud, uh, not myself, but for NYLC, of that tool because service learning can be, and I think you're hearing it in this call, sometimes perceived as very abstract, complex, you know, 500 miles above the situation. And so it's very hard to talk to others about, you know, we should try this. And and a lot of times you'd like that emotional piece. Well, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And so the lift are a set of videos um, that go through each one of the eight standards and try to show you what does youth voice look like? What would a classroom look like? Um, that employs youth voice and what are some of the outcomes when you do that and these are real worlds uh, real settings there's a school in New Orleans uh, uh, Louisiana I should say and then one in Philadelphia and one in St. Paul and each come with a different age group and a different orientation and and so each one of these slides I think are really helpful and and I've heard this many times from teachers when teachers are explain, explaining to students why service learning or if they're explaining to their peers or to a system, service learning is important because, look, this is what it is. This is what it looks like. And I think it really gets to that belief component. This is possible and this is worth doing rather than just another academic idea. Yes, seeing is believing. That's right. Isn't that so? So district-wide initiative, um, right now what we're looking for is we're looking to engage district leaders uh, because we want to be involved in a study, an analysis. Where is this district going? What are their values? What's fundamentally important um, so that we can start to determine is there an alignment here? We have no interest in shopping just for the sheer numbers of districts to engage. We want to find right fits and have huge victories. So um, aligning of those resources and uh, following that, if let's say we, we do find some fits like we did in uh, Guilford County, then we go through a, a process of mapping out professional development, service learning for principals, teachers, and then we uh, also engage youth um, in that district so that they are also playing their right role in, in owning this initiative and their responsibility and the capacity. We also, it's not on here, but we also engage the community in significant ways in this process very often as well. And uh, with the GSN piece, as I mentioned, um, that sustained, sustained support is promised, guaranteed, and fundamentally important. Uh, we don't have an environment anymore where we can just have that uh, fall workshop and think mm-hmm. that's transforming practices. So on the next slide, I just I reemphasize that, that uh, we understand that school districts, uh, that third-party engagement, school districts have to say no a thousand times. And that was my job as a principal for a period of time, to to meet people and say, wow, that's a fantastic idea. I bet that's important, but no. <laughs> I have to say no all the time. That's a painful thing, and, and, and the people will shake their head and walk away. But it was a good idea. How could you possibly say no? You have to select where you're going to say yes. You have to make choices. It's that, that filtering out, and then where you say yes, you must succeed. You must make it vital and important and uh, winnable. And so um, we think that the issue of student engagement is worth saying yes, and uh, we think we're look well, we know that we're looking for districts that want to address that student engagement, engagement issue, tackle that head-on, and have things align so that we're all consciously trying to tackle that issue. So that's why we think a third party is is of benefit, too, because um, it asks you to organize your work and think about your work as a district or as a school or as a teacher in a particular way, and then provide the help and support so that uh, you're uh, always given access to uh, best practices and and others who are in the same battle, so to speak. So that's that's uh, I've got that one last slide on the district systemic approach, but I don't know that um, I haven't said too much. Uh, I don't say too much there that I haven't said already. Um, uh, again, uh, we really are interested in finding uh, districts um, or components of districts over the next couple of years, and uh, we'll see where this goes. It's exciting for us. 
Well, and certainly you've got the outcomes and experience in Guilford County now that um, that you've been relating to us as we've moved through the program that uh, support that this is this is the way to go. A systemic renewal is one of our uh, 15 strategies, Sam, and, and wouldn't you say this would be part of that solution to the dropout crisis in addition to service learning? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, that, that's, uh, we, we've commented many times that these strategies um, overlap, and service learning is one of those strategies that contains so many other rich strategies. Mm-hmm. And you know, But, you know, I, and I, I realize we're a little over time here, but um, um, Jim's question is still annoying at me, actually. And, and Mike, I think your 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 answer was uh, was more than adequate. It was a, a, a great answer, having to do with uh, belief and changes mm-hmm. in belief mm-hmm. systems and how difficult that is to do. I think you were realistic, you know, about that. But but I also detected uh, some frustration um, in that question, maybe even. Exasperation, mm. um, <laughs> as a, as a former principal and superintendent, also, um, you know, uh, th- this whole issue of how do you how do you get a teacher to you know the question starts that way, and and um, generally it has uh, to do with you know when we're looking at these issues and research is telling us about how to improve education, and then you have that question in the mix. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you're you're absolutely right. There's not an easy answer to that, but I do I do think that um, you know, again, sort of list, looking systemically at a solution to that. You know, we we have to start with pre-service education. Our schools of education really have to emphasize more. I think with beginning uh, teachers or, or or people in training to be teachers, the importance of of these kinds of things and and. There could be any ending to that uh, that uh, um, mm-hmm. last part to that question. You know, why is that we've covered in this in this radio broadcast? You know, why is service learning not fluff, or right. uh, wh- why does education need to be meaningful? You know, uh, you can you can. There's a litany of them, but that, that's one area to start. The second, um, and we've always we've also emphasized uh, this here, and we're in uh, a developmental process for some of this is really first-class quality professional development, uh, and that is in-service training mm-hmm. uh, that is systemic, that is continuous, um, that is not just a, a summer workshop. You, you mentioned that or, or a, um, you know, a conference um, here or there, but, uh, but something uh, far more um, extensive and, and, and reaching than that that engages uh, faculty and it even engages them in the kind of School-based research that helps convince people to change uh, beliefs or helps move beliefs. A third, I think, that I've found, and I've, in my teacher training with Teacher Corps, we found this to be true: that um, th- th- you know there has to be kind of a critical mass um, at mm-hmm. a school. Mm-hmm. You've got to have enough believers to to, to change beliefs. Right. And um, and then maybe the last one, and and this is systemic also, is the evaluation process used at that school or in that district. Uh, that this is um, important and is one of the things um, that is being evaluated. So, um, you know, can can I jump in? Sure, yeah, absolutely. You, you yeah. caused me to uh, to jar another thought that I think is maybe of of use here. You know, when when people. You can imagine a situation where somebody walked up to you and because they wanted to see a change in what you were doing, and they said to you, "You know what's wrong with you, and here's how I'm going to help." <laughs> you, know, you know, when you begin with that orientation, you you got a battle on your yeah, hands, and, and you're unlikely <laughs> to, you know. And and I, and I heard in Jim this this issue of seeking a change for somebody, mm-hmm. and one of the th- so you have to kind of tap into what are the things that do end up creating change for other people. And I do believe, and it comes from my teaching and, and, and my life as administrator and such, that work from the positive. So if you say that there's a teacher who is really, or a school or a district, whatever, that's really battling on a particular important issue and you just know that needs to change, mm-hmm. it's seldom beneficial to go to that one negative problem and point it out and really you know, focus on it. Sometimes it's very beneficial to say, here are some really strong things that I want to help grow with you and, and get somebody feeling that confidence, yeah. get them feeling like the, the capability. You know what? Time and again, I have seen this happen, that the problem is subsumed by the, the strength over and over again. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I'm not a big fan of, well, we'll just give them more training. 
more technique, tell them how to ride the bicycle better. Uh, I don't think that creates the sort of belief change we need sometimes. And so I think an inspired space often comes from a, a capable place. Yep, absolutely. Well, uh, Jim, thank you for that question. And for yeah. all of you who called in or wrote, thank you for those questions. You can see the value of that kind of interaction uh, with us and with our guests because it, it, it has us all thinking in different directions and really enriches the process. But this is, uh, uh, Mike, you've packed so much um, into this hour. <laughs> uh, and, and it... Uh, it uh, it only um, reinforces for us, as most of these programs do, how much more time we need on each of these topics. But you've certainly given us food for thought, a valuable hour of learning, um, more about the highs and lies of service learning and how it well, become a part of more part of, of school improvement. And I, I really like the connection with uh, with the engagement uh, issue. Well, thank you so much, and I, and I mean it sincerely. This has been a great opportunity, and. Um, um, this is, feels like the front end of a strong relationship for all of our organizations. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. It's been an ongoing, continuing relationship. And I have to tell you, as I sit here watching the board coming alive with people who have never listened to this program before and where have you been hiding? This is so great. Or, our, our, oh, by the way, I've got to tell you, Carl sent a message that it's seven degrees above zero seven. there. <laughs> well, so, that's warm for Alaska. So spring is in Alaska, too, you know. So we appreciate Carl tuning in again. He's a great, it's a great listener. And, and we have lots of great listeners and lots of new ones. And so, and, and my privilege just sitting here between two wise men, you know, one here in the studio and one in Minnesota and just benefiting from your wisdom and sage advice to others who called in. I mean, I think it's, I just have the best seat in the house here right now. So it's been great for uh, me to be here. And thank you, Mike, for joining us because um, you know how much we value your work and for you to spend this time with us is is very meaningful for us. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, and really up to all of us now to explore further what's been presented here and really begin to apply these solutions to our work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, it's time for me to remind our listeners that this radio webcast, like all our monthly programs, will be archived on our website within the next few hours. And it's downloadable for your iPod or your MP3 player. So um, you can go back and you can listen again. You can re- recommend this to your friends. Like Sam said in the beginning, this is great for professional development. If you've been listening in and thinking, boy, I wish my school or my, my friends had heard this, this is an opportunity because we can you can play it again and again. You just can't call Mike. That's the only thing. But you can email him through us because we will definitely, or through his uh, email address, right, Mike? We can send to you. I think, uh, with your email address there on the website. So you can continue the conversation. Uh, My favorite thing, we have an iTunes site. You can subscribe to Solutions. And those of you who said, um, do you do this often? Someone asked, do you do this every month? We've been doing it for over 30 months, I think, Sam. So there's lots of programs there. If you like it, you got some catching up We're to do. We've got iTunes library. <laughs> yeah, we got an iTunes library. you got some catching up to do. So uh, please do that. Anyway, um, it's been a pleasure for me today. And I, I I love the way you answered that question about fun and meaning. That that was, to me, the, the highlight in addition to my two favorite slides. Well, in April, our guest is going to be Dr. Terry Peterson, and that's going to be a treat. Terry is um, an expert at uh, so many things having to do with um, education. He's been in so many leadership and policy positions, so we're we're really happy to have him on the program and to um, um, to, to hear from him um, about after-school programs. He's he's currently working with the After School Alliance. So mark your calendars now. I think it's Tuesday, April the tenth at three thirty. Eastern Time. And we want to thank uh, all of you for listening and participating. Remember, we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research based solutions, we can assure that all of our students graduate. Join us next time for more solutions to the dropout crisis.